<laughs> yeah, I'm not ranking that, I'm too biased. Let's instead take a look at 50 other deserving tracks. 50? How long is... For the greater good. But first things first, this video is spoiler free on the level of watching a trailer or uh, hearing this track right now, and that's not even its real name, just in case. Please mark your spoilers down in the comments. And with that said, let's dive right in with number 50, the... Ah, so close! Number 51, the prologue. You can barely hear it in game, so I removed the noise. It's really good. Wait, play that again? That's what I thought. Eight seconds into the game, already a musical reference. And then it goes places, but in particular, the way it ends. So that's one cutscene track out of like 50 of those, so I have to leave out a heartbreaking amount. Like um, that early cutscene uh, with the child soldiers that uses a line motif we can't recognize yet. When Tyon does something badass. When Mio. Uh, um, when Mio tells Noah about her flute. This no spoiler thing is hard. Uh, this. This positive twist on the death motif is about new life. While well, this next track is about old death. There's a heroic sacrifice against the game's best bad guy. There's an impossible choice. People joining the fray. This. This. This? Still the same track. Again the same track. A cutscene track that had to make the cut though is number 50, Mobius. Well, of course the bad guys get their own sinister theme. That's just a given. But it's a later part that's iconic. Gotta love when Xenoblade brings in vocals. The coming part is uh, recognizable. Keeping your out for that light motif from now on. Number 49, Cave. Pretty interesting for a cave theme. And it reminds me of old indie gem Aquaria, so that's a win. Later on it gains in intensity and adds vocals. Number 48, Ribby Flats. It's so overwhelmingly peaceful. Number 47, Onwards. This plays on the way to the final dungeon. What I called the death motif earlier is more accurately the offseer motif, heavily remixed throughout this track. I'm not even sure what motif that was, as those few notes could be Mobius or Roboros. They have similarities. Oh, and this is a fake name, so as not to spoil what the final dungeon is. You're welcome. Number 46, Uraean Tunnels. 
So, not a spoiler, many areas in 3 are remixes from 1 and 2, and the same goes for their music. In this, you can hear bits of Tefra Cave, Ether Mines, Bionis' Interior, and of course, Eurea. As for number 45, Capitalcorn Peak, this one has some Elpis, Pollen Arm, and Oresco later on. Uh, just go listen to it, uh, we have so much more to cover. Number 44, Battle on the Seas. No, that's, he's a pirate. Ah, let's try that again. No, that's not it. That's, uh, Destroy the Colossus. Hmm, again. Yeah, yeah, this is the one. So this is the first game in the Xenoblade series where you can fight while swimming. No, this is Aerith Sea. As a battle theme. And I guess it's Skyrim now. Number 43. Sword Valley from Xenoblade 1 is a pretty oppressive theme, so it's enjoyable when the composers flex and reimagine it as this for the Great Sword's base. And later on, you even get. Number 42. A big colony. People hear so many things in this track. The Ancient Vessel from uh, Xenoblade 2? Mekonis Field from 1? Or does this remind you of Nier? Or going back to 1998, Xenogears? Which was composed by Yasunori Mitsuda? Yeah, it's time to talk composers. The musical identity common to Xenoblade 1, 2, and 3 is Ace and Kenji Hiramatsu. They are Goreplane and Gormot. Engage the enemy and counter attack. An obstacle in our path and incoming! our names and recall them. Recall the names, you know, our names, their names. But the Zin Raid... But the Zin Raid soundtracks are sprawling and Manami Kiyota is responsible for a ton of low-key area and cutscene tracks, mostly in Xenoblade 1. Although Zanza the Divine, not low-key. Well, Kyota is back in force in this game, this being the fifth track in a row she's credited for. Good for her. Side note, if I seem to forget Xenoblade X, it's because its music doesn't share the same identity, being entirely composed by Hiroyuki Sawano going in a different direction. Still banging though. Show a sign for now, show a sign for where we can go. Coming back to Xenogears composer Mitsuda, this uh, Big Colony track is co-credited to him, one of only two tracks in my list with two composer credits. Oh, and this part references the Ouroboros motif, which we are not done hearing. Number 
41, Epilogue. You beat the final boss, you get one last hit of light motifs, namely the Offseer motif. And the Mobius motif. Uh, I'm fairly sure these are two separate tracks, so this is a top 52. Number 40, Agnes Castle. You don't hear this one much if you're just moving through the game, but depending on whether you stay and listen in chapter 5 or 6, it hits uh, quite differently. Alright, if you pause, uh, the menu music takes over. <laughs> Number 39, Robot Battle. Gonna blast them into next week. What can I say? You fight big robots and the music fits. Number 38, Melia's theme. She did not have a theme in her original game, but here she gets a mix of Aerith Sea with a sprinkling of Alchemoth. Good for her. She looks creepy though. Number 37, LA's Highway. Many people have an emotional connection with the first version of this track. No... Uh, yeah. Number 36, Peaceful Colony. Haven't I heard this in Etrian Odyssey? Every game in the Etrian Odyssey series has something like this as their first area theme. And I do mean every game. But the first colony you encounter in this game is not at peace. Uh, it's your hometown, Colony 9. Uh, yeah, if you're expecting anything like the first game, well, it's clearly not that Colony 9. Number 35, Soldier's Peon. This is the starting village theme. Your immediate reaction should be, that's no colony, it's a military outpost. And then you recall the prologue, and yeah, this is what a colony is in this world. And the music makes the people sound happy with the only life they know. Number 34, Quiz. What do you get when you mix Aerith C with Leftheria? Aerithia C. With a pretty memorable soundscape. And later on... You get this sweeping, mesmerizing part. to listen to it forever so you pause the game okay let's get you out of the way number 33 a menu unfortunately you cannot pause to listen to other music fortunately this elevator music is pretty good and should last you through the whole game without getting tiring the first time you open the menu you've just gone through the intense prologue and maybe bounced between dreary everblight plane and energetic keves battle so when uh, this washes over you, you're like, finally I can soak my worries away. 
Also, the menu music is actually called Iris Network. So does it exist in-universe? I like to imagine our heroes chilling to it. Number 32, title screen. The first time you hear it, uh, it it's good piano. It might make you emotional. But listen to it again as you progress through the game and uh, you can hear all the motifs that compose it and it's elevated by that. Speaking of motifs, it's time to talk about Offseers. People keep dying in the Xenoblade 3 world and Offseers are essentially spirit guides who lay the dead to rest by playing the flute. Why the flute? Because it's compact and robust enough to be carried onto the battlefield. The first time you hear the Offseeing leitmotif is during a number 31, Kevisi Homecoming. Now, this doesn't sound like the usual motif, because the most recognizable version is actually the Agnian one. But if I nudge both together, uh, the difference is readily heard. They do fit really well, I wonder how this could pay off. The off-seeing tunes are integral to this game, to the point of being part of the gameplay, you regularly come across dead bodies and you send them. That was Noah's of seeing tune anyway. Here's Chris's. Here's Miyabi's. The off-seeing tunes are credited to Yasunori Mitsuda. His first contribution to the series was the ending theme of Xenoblade 1, Beyond the Sky, featuring Céline Dion. I know I won't look behind, oh wait. I, see no uh, I am told this is actually Sarah Alain. It was her first professional recording and was received so well, she then switched careers to become a professional singer. Good for her. Now, every game in the series has its own distinct musical flavor, most obviously Xenoblade X, of course. But Xenoblade 1 was kicked off by prolific Yoko Shimomura with the prologue and Colony 9. And the battle theme, which is so obviously hers, but this is not how Xenoblade battle music sounds, right? That's because from the second game on, it's Kenji Hiramatsu who was let loose to infuse more and more funk into the battle music to delightful results. Now, Mitsuda wrote a lot of tracks for Xenoblade 2, but it's only for the third game that, best I can determine, he was put in charge. Drunk on power, he had Noah and Mio's flutes built for real, before composition even began, and those are the physical flutes we hear throughout the soundtrack. The homecoming track ends by introducing us to Noah's of Cyril in the most marvelous way. Number 30. Take the off motif 
played with piano and strings despite those instruments not being waterproof to tears and you get uh, the bereaved and those left behind this game's a sad theme number 29 hey new xenoblade game i am so hyped to explore your first area to awesome music i mean colony 9 Primordia Argentum Let's go right in Not, uh, what I had in mind. Oh, it's like Xenoblade 2's Tan Tall, but depressing. There's this constant ticking sound, like it doesn't want you to forget about your flame clock? Oh, this is beautiful though. Those silent stretches. This track really sets the tone for the rest of the game. But this last part is transcendent, starting with the bass. Fort Overbus. It's pretty smooth to start with. And then two minutes pass and it loops. Or does it? The vocalist is uh, Yuka, who I'm fairly sure we heard in the definitive edition of Xenoblade 1. And that was the night version of Fort Overbus. You'd recognize the day version from the trailer that was just showing off environments. 
there's this annoying buzz though. It's in the trailer and in the game. Uh, let's hope it's gone in the official soundtrack release. Oh, and I want both versions of this track in my top 50, which is now a top 53 then. Number 27, Commander Battle. I'm getting vibes of Majora's Mask and Gravity Rush 2. You hear it or you don't. But in particular, this sounds like a lost Grant Kirkhope final boss theme, both in structure and individual passages. It sounds like her vibrato anyway. Uh, listen, just find and listen to this track. It goes places. I gotta kill you now, sorry. Number 26, Alfito Valley. Number 25, Final Dungeon. This Final Dungeon track immediately reminded me of 1995's Chrono Trigger's Final Dungeon Black Omen. This is a very abridged cut. Well, Chrono Trigger was all Mitsuda, it was his first soundtrack. Back to Xenoblades. This next part has the Mobius motif. Over delicious bass. The drums here. Yeah, careful there. Cutting it close. This guitar sounds like it's laughing. It 
incredible to me how recognizable Mitsuda's style is from 1995 to 2022. There's uh, one problem though. The Final Dungeon has multiple versions of this music, but this one the best by far. Barely please. You'll likely 100% the game without hearing most of this. But let's get back to negative percent. The very beginning. The announcement trailer. Fighting in order to live. It had some pretty good music, and if I turn down uh, the Living voices and the sound effects, we can uh, better hear. Number 24. Uroboros Awakening. The beginning sounds suspiciously like Mobius, but with much more random chord changes. It's like Uroboros, the heroes, are throwing a wrench into Mobius's plans. RTG142857 on Twitter has more to say if you're versed in music theory. He's also to thank for helping maintain the Xeno series wiki and for directly helping me uh, make sense of a couple motifs. Now you heard the vocals at the beginning there and uh, thought, uh, sweet, it's uh, that vocalist from Mobius again. Yeah, Lauren. But no, this is Aisling McGlynn. Same surname? Yes. To contrast Mobius and Uroboros, but highlight parallels between them, Mitsuda gave each half to a different sister. Oh, and their father is Michael McGlynn, as seen here. Now, half of you are going, oh yeah, that. For the others, uh, this is from Xenoblade 2. It plays here. Back to Uroboros, the most recognizable part is not heard in the trailer. Number 23 is not this. This is Running from Xenoblade 2, which I was reminded of by number 23, Battle Theme, Hostile Colony. Now, Xenoblade 3 occasionally does something that I touched on in another video. Uh, something really cool here that very few games do is when you're not fighting, instead of cutting to field music, the game just goes to a low-key version of the battle theme. So here, you're just running around with the music already pretty tense. Yeah, the battle music just springs in. Good though. Wait, that sounds familiar. That sounds really familiar. Resuming. And this might as well be Ace Combat. Mm. 
Number 22, Where We Belong. One of two tracks with lyrics, this one is sung by newcomer Sarah Wida from Anuna. should probably cut this short just in case the lyrics spoil anything, which I am not saying they do. Uh, they may be the, but number 21 is not this. Uh, this is Drifting Soul from Xenoblade 2, arguably Nia's theme. Number 21, Nia's theme. So here, Drifting Soul officially becomes Nia's theme, but arranged in a way befitting a queen, helped by the Libera Boys Choir. Good for her. She looks creepy though. And here is a soloist, Luca Brugnoli. Number 20, Feelings Risen to the Sky, is yet another cutscene featuring the off seer motif. But when you've been going, what? Impossible! For two minutes straight, hearing this triumphant rendition gives you permission to breathe again. It's a contender for the best moment in the game. And this music is actually reused later to superb effect. Most cutscene versions of this motif don't have time for its three flourishes. They don't fit naturally in regular time, so either one is cut or they get stretched. But it's like this version is not worried about conforming to the beat, it's just in a hurry to make you feel good. Also earlier, there is a part where you hear two flutes playing in unison, and it means everything. Oh, my hair. It's gotten kinda long. Number 19, Final Boss. Listen. Final boss music is reliable, and this one does what it's supposed to. Ominous vocals? Check. Mobius motif? Check. Unleashed electric guitar? That plays the first part of the Mobius motif while strings play another part? Just keeps going! Check! Number 80! Oh, you're still going!
and that's a contender for best minute of the soundtrack. Number 18 Troubled me at first, uh, because initially it sounds like something straight out of Donkey Kong Country 3. trouble because now it was Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze, one of the best soundtracks of the last decade, by the way. And that settled it! This is pretty much Seashore War by David Wise, which he described as my favorite song I've composed. This one's in 3-4 though, but if I go through the trouble of aligning both... We get an acoustic guitar duo. Back to Aegis Wilderness alone, eventually it reaches its natural loop point. But instead the track picks up. And at the next natural loop point... It picks up again! and Judith play off each other so beautifully. The night version is notable too, going uh, full Judith at first. bringing in vocals for the close. Number 17, Boundary. The moment when this first plays is pretty sweet. It's been a while since we last got to do this, whatever that is. And then the track goes places, but I would not rank it this high. The thing is, this isn't even its final form. Later in the game, it gets upgraded to that music that featured in a trailer. Like term, eh? If I turn down the voices and sound effects, uh, we can better hear number 17, Upgraded Boundary. Let's hear what's past the trailer now. It's even better! What? It's 
slight favorite of mine. Time to fight Binus's shoulder. It keeps moving up. Okay, the loop is much more obvious though. Still, that was a contender for best minute of the soundtrack. Uh, so I still want the bass version somewhere lower in this top 50, uh, putting us at 54. Number 16. Ultimate enemy, the super boss theme. Used the once. So uh, when's the battle happening? Let's just move on. Number 15. Right. It's all but confirmed that this track is sole contribution of Yutaka Kunigo, a sound planner at Monolith Soft whom I cannot even find a picture of because this is his first composition to his name ever. Good going! Oh, that face! Oh, don't miss the drop. Like many other battle themes, this is a multi-parter, but uh, here is just a different intro and a later passage and some right symbols that it'll remove, so not the most notable. Well, good thing I love you too. Number 15, Agnes Battle. This actually sounds like an area theme in the style of More Ardain, but as a regular battle theme, it's heavily brought down by its 33 second intro. it's begun and even from here it takes a while to get going imagine if instead it started on this foot And the last part you'll only hear if you prolong a battle on purpose. It should be a crime to waste three four-minute battle teams like this. And time to fight Binus's shoulder. Number 14, words that never reached you. Like previous games in this series, 3 has its own sad battle theme. Uh, plays multiple 
multiple times, but in particular at a certain poignant point in the story. You know which one it is. It's so over the top and I love it for it. No! Number 13, Milik Meadows. A worthy successor to Goreplane and Gormot. But two things drag it down in the rankings. First, the competition is brutal. Second, this game is bleak. So at the point this plays, the adventurous spirit doesn't feel that credible. Although it's still very welcome. In any case, the part before the loop is majestic. video on gore playing Malik Meadows and how the series uses area themes to push you to adventure. You might see it in your recommendations. Number 12, A Step Away, which was heard in a trailer, so guess it's time for you know what? once, but what brings it up in the rankings is that were you to listen to it just one hour later, its lyrics would take on new meanings. And same uh, at the end of the game. Like where we belong, this too has Sarawida singing, and if you've played the game, both are wont uh, to make you cry. And speaking of crying, number 11. The Kevesi homecoming was fine, but the Agnion one, I'm not feeling it. Please, please. Not, not the flutes. This is torture. Oh, no, 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 you know what? I, I just don't want the motif at all. Did you really just say you're an seer? These are my emotions here, they're not some toys you can just play with. That was absolutely gorgeous and a contender for best minute of the soundtrack, but I will need a while to recover. 30 minutes later. Entering the top 10 with the boss theme. Ah, oh, that 
space. Horror strings. Regular time signature, I like those. And the guitar does not let up. And you're like, cool, it's good, I get it. But it's more than strong enough to punch your lights out. And if it looped here, it would be great already. But it's got more in stock. Last part before the loop. So it's about to loop, but actually there's more. Like most bus music in the game, there's a second phase, which can play when the bus gets low on HP. This when it's at critical HP. And then it ends either abruptly or one of the following ways. Action. Regular. Sad. Well, now I'm sad. Number 9, Mobius and Battle. The game's best bad guy after Mobius T, of course, gets his own dramatic battle theme, which reinterprets the whole Mobius track in the 6 8 time signature. an additional part that often plays when there's Mobius around. They could have just played Mobius, but instead they remade it beat for beat. And there's a second phase which quotes the three parts of Uroboros in reverse order. and then goes to the off-seer motif to complete the trifecta. And goes places with it.
it segues right into the phase one track in its entirety. You'll probably finish the battle before the full loop can play. These are my emotions here! They're not some toys you can just play with! Number 8. Tactical Action First battle theme of the game grabbed me immediately. Maybe because I'm a huge Chrono Trigger simp? Together now? Mitsuda was personally telling me, remember when you first fell in love with my music? Come here, I got something for you. And then, fitting me for a game about cycles, it's back as the final dungeon battle theme, but enhanced. This is a different track though, so we're at 55. It just keeps dialing up the intensity. I love that. It's not higher is we're already looping that was over way too soon hear that Mitsuda I wanted something a bit with more uh, on the bone you know still contender for best minute of the soundtrack hey what does that mean it's clearly Mitsuda They do sound alike too. Okay then, let's call tactical action a Hiramatsu homage to Mitsuda's Chrono Trigger. Number 7! Hey, isn't that Drifting Soul? It really is Drifting Soul! Yeah, let's take this part of the original. Make it faster and higher pitched. You. Yes, mix the boss. Insert that into this track. See? A perfect fit! I used my thinking muscles for this one. Seven, Drifting Soul reimagined as a modern Sonic final bus track. Okay, let's say Drifting Soul Battle or something. Oh my. All together now? So tell me why I'm here and what's the reason I am here today If I called it was you, you wish that I would stay No matter how much wind will blow against me, I will keep on oh, I will keep moving on to find the answer to I'm lost in search for you As much as I feel like singing, it's an instrumental. There's this sweet guitar solo in the middle too. 
but listen to how it loops. Yeah, don't miss out on this one. Now let's close the book on the off-seer motif. Some would call it overused, being at the core of every emotional moment in the game. But you know me, if only through this video so far, I love it when the music and the game connect to become more than their sum. And number six, A Life Sent On, is a diegetic duet. You can't just go, oh, listen to this banger. No, everyone knows what a duet is. My point is, this track needs its context. So, Noah is introduced as a passionate off-seer, as you recall, who believes everyone, friend or foe, deserves to be laid to rest properly. Early in the game, Noah and Mio meet on the battlefield as enemies. And, uh... have a rhythm. I know how that goes. One, two, three, four, one, two, three. But then they have to team up against the common foe. Afterwards, they remain enemies, but. Oh, let's just watch. Hey, is she? Yeah, an Agni and Offseer. Personally, this is the moment that broke me. Thank you for doing this with me. But this scene has more layers. When Noah joins her, Mio is understandably taken aback, as she usually plays in unison. But look at Noah's smug face as he keeps playing, looking her in the eye, goading her to resume. Mio is just doing her duty, but... <laughs> Noah is an off-seeing nerd. Recall how he got the upper hand earlier. I know how that goes. So Mio collects herself, and they both continue playing, but Noah is not following the script. Not that Mio would know. At this point, the Kevesi version would go... But instead, Noah skips to a later part because he feels it will complement the Agnian version better. Noah is improvising and enjoying playing in harmony in a way he would never get to. And from that point on, when you find dead bodies... Such is the Offseer's duty.
There's no overstating how important this light motif is. It's the first thing we ever heard about the game in the announcement trailer. And it's the last song you hear in the game after the credits. By now we're just going through the tracks Nintendo previewed before release, uh, which they picked really well. And for the top 5, I'm downplaying motif, context, emotions. Let's go for pure listening bliss. If you've seen my top 10 tracks pre Xenoblade 3, know that Fog Beast was my number 11. And I am happy to report that Xenoblade 3 is a worthy successor in number 5, a formidable enemy. This is the battle theme that suffers most from being buried under combat shouts and sound effects and uh, the sound of my voice right now actually. listen to the full thing, but here's another contender for best minute in the soundtrack, shutting on now. Chain Attack! By who else but Kenji Hiramatsu. As a general rule, if you say a battle theme is a banger, then it's Ace. If it's a bop, it's Hiramatsu. A huge strike against this one, it's often unwelcome. It will cut off battle themes you wanted more of, and will even ruin a couple emotional fights. If you hear anything I've missed, a comment and I'll bump you up. Another thing that keeps this back from the number one spot is that it's... <sighs> I can't believe I'm about to say this about such a great track. 
It's uh, generic. Ah, oh, I love it so much. But it's not emblematic of Xenoblade 3. I could listen to it on loop any day though. Number 3. The Weight of Life. A worthy successor to engage the enemy and counterattack. But isn't this game already overstuffed with intense cutscene music? Let's see. Engage the enemy in the first game plays nine times. Counter attack on the second eight times. As for the weight of life, twice. Which does not mean it holds anything back. Try to hear the bass if you can. The main motif sounds suspiciously close to engage the enemy, but it stops short, intentionally, to torture us. And the whole thing sounds faster than its predecessors. Let's check. Engage the enemy is... That's 85 BPM. Counter-attack... 90 BPM. The weight of life... 85 BPM, but listen to that drum and the bass. They play double time, so it's like they're driving us to 170 BPM. And here, finally, we are granted some engage the enemy. some counter-attack for good measure. But it's still so bleak. This piano is by far the softest part of the tree tracks. But you can still imagine the driving drum so it stays tense. However, It's gonna be okay. Key change! Like the rest of the game, it's still bleak, but you can feel a glimmer of hope. And if the flute can come back... Motif. Number 2. We've already gone through all the other tracks from the first half hour of the game. Title screen. Prologue. Tactical action. Child soldiers. 
Homecoming. Everbright Plain. All pretty depressing. But if the menu track tells you to relax, well, Keves Battle tells you to enjoy. The flute represents Noah, of course, and he's shouting his attacks and bonding with his friends over combat. So this really is your cue to enjoy the game without any guilt over how messed up the world is in all aspects. Come here! I got something for you! You're a lifesaver! It makes for a huge mood whiplash, but uh, it's really welcome. Problem is, uh, by this point, battles are over. So the real experience is hearing the high-pitched flutes of the introduction over and over, which is not for everyone. And I know, I know this is Hiramatsu, but once again, I heard Mitsuda's Chrono Trigger in this. If I layer a bass track from a Muse Chord chart I found... Another homage? Anyway, like is often the case in this soundtrack, instead of looping, it picks up! The lead is split between flute, piano, violin, even electric guitar. it has to loop but number one what else but You will know our names, which includes two separate minutes, each contender for best of the soundtrack. There is nothing to say against this track. It's got all the instruments you want, with each musician having the time of their life. It has three drops, unlike the single one in its predecessors, uh, and it's perfectly used in game. Always a pleasure to hear. It even has the same extra phases as the boss theme when the unique enemy gets low on HP, as well as a proper ending. I explore all the icons of the series in a separate video that appears here and in the description if released. Alright then, thanks for watching. Are we not done? Okay, pretty good. Oh, the dissonance. Just like that, contender for best minute of the soundtrack. But I know a build up when I hear one. What could possibly follow something of that?
this part is just a new soundscape. I've never heard anything that sounds like it. Oh, the bass is being low-key awesome. Uh, no longer low-key. preparing something now again with the new soundscape jealous of bars the chorus that got to record this but maybe they'd be jealous of what I get to record anyway of course this deserves the top spot but there's more Like uh, some other boss themes, it has multiple phases. Then it's similar to the original for the better part of a minute. But when it's back to this part, it picks up. Even more, it can have a low HP phase that either sounds over the top heroic or dramatic. And like the main boss theme, it has three possible endings. Only thing that bothers me with this as number one is that it's missing the iconic flutes. Well, now I'm sad. Or is it? Yeah, at some point in the game, flutes play over it for three whole phases, and it's super meaningful. Uh, Mobius Battle is such a clear-cut number one, which means everything else gets bumped down. 
I mean, it might be like three or four tracks. Uh, I'll just uh, slot it right at the top. Uh, this top 50 is a complete bust that I hope you enjoyed nonetheless. Maybe you even learned something that didn't bore. If I'm lucky, I didn't make too many factual errors. Uh, I know I came real close to a couple and we're still missing a lot of information. I will heart any correction to the top. Again, you can find the real track names in the first comment, properly hidden as spoilers, of course. I'll leave you with the video suggestions. Uh, in any case, good job on watching this one to the end. Thanks for that. See you around.